Mark Seven Twenty Eighty Three. This is Jay Park. Interview with Mavis Deering. D A E R I N G. Mrs. Deering, where were you born? Uh, Harmony, Oklahoma. In the Osage Nation. <laughs> and when's your birthday? August thirty one, nineteen twenty nine. 1929. Who is your father? Uh, you want his full name? Yes, ma'am. Francis Earl Langley. L A N G L E Y? Yes. As Langley, Oklahoma? Right. Very same. And your mother? Uh, Anna Elvira. Christy Langley. Christy. C H R I S T I E. Hmm. An old Cherokee name. Mm -hmm. What kind of work did your father do? He worked in the oil fields uh, at various jobs, uh, and he was then he worked as a lumber worker in California. And also, he was a pipe fitter and a tailor. His part-time job, he was a tailor. Hmm. A variety of things. You're certainly right. Were both your parents born in Oklahoma? Yes, both uh, near Westville. Okay. You want to know their birth dates? Yes, ma'am. All right. My dad's birth date was uh, January 4, 1906, and my mother's birth date, November 2, 1902. Is your mother descended from the Christies that came from Georgia no. after the Budno incident? No, my mother's grandfather was a white man. Uh, what, he was born in South Carolina, and his family moved to Alabama and then to Texas. So he grew up, or lived in Texas for a long while. Uh, he was John Francis Marion Christie, and that's who the little community of Christie was named for. And that's where my mother lives presently. <coughs> and her grandmother was, uh, if you're interested, a star. Uh, her name was Jane V. Star, and she was the daughter of James Star, who was a signer of the treaty, and uh, he was killed, you know, because mm -hmm. of that, with the ridges and okay. the Boonots and all those uh, people. And the reason that, uh, okay, so they sent her grandmother down to Texas to live, where she lived with a family because uh, I'm sure that you have read this, but um, the people that killed her father had said they were going to kill, especially all the male members of the family and possibly all the family, just because he had signed the treaty, you know, because of this conflict in the tribe. So they sent her down to uh, Texas, and that's where she met John Francis Mary and Christy. <coughs> Where was uh, Mr. Starr killed? Uh, east of Stillwell. Uh, he lived, uh, let me see, He they had left. After he had signed the treaty, he and his family left uh, the Cherokee Agency about 1837. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> when they arrived in this, in this territory, uh, they arrived near Cane, what's now Cane Hill, Arkansas. So his home, the home he built, is uh, east of Stillwell, but nevertheless, I think it's on Highway 100. Uh, it's on the road going to Cane Hill, so he built a home very near where they had arrived, you know. Mm -hmm. And at his home, he was killed there at his home. Who killed him? There were uh, approximately 15 men rode up to the gate and uh, shot him, uh, members of the opposing faction. Is that the John Moore faction? Yes, I think so, yes. 
And his son was Tom Starr, who, as you will know in, in Cherokee history, became a outlaw, and he's the only man that the government ever made a treaty with. Now, Zeke Proctor, of course, they uh, received a pardon, but uh, Tom Starr is the only one that received a treaty from the government. And uh, he became an outlaw because of this, all this problems in the tribe. And uh, <clears throat> according to, you know, people in the family, uh, well, my mom's grandmother, I, <laughs> to be exact, she said that he had said, I saw all the men that killed my dad, and, and before I die, I'm going to kill all of them. You know, this uh -huh. is the way it was in those days. So, Did he? And more. Guess. They said, I don't know. Uh, it, it's rumored that he killed 30 men. So. Do you know what happened to the treaty? No, I don't. But, you know, I've wondered if we could send to the archives maybe. And uh, I don't know about the one he had. He did have uh, two granddaughters that were living. Yet yeah, they were, oh, this must have been eight years ago or nine that were living down near Porham in Briartown, but I'm sure they must, I don't think they're still living, but they were in their 80s then. But they had family pictures and... What are their names? Uh, let's see, we went down to visit. One of them was Cherokee Roberson, R-O-B-E-R-S-O-N. She lived at Porham, out in the country mm -hmm. from Porham, and the other one was Lucy Manus, M-A-N-U-S. There are, of course, other relatives living in that area. Let me see, at Briartown, there's a man named Buck Barnes, who also is a relative. I would think if, if the treaty still exists, the paper itself, that probably some of them would have it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what part of Georgia did your family come from? My dad's folks came from LJ, Georgia, E L L I J A Y, and um, <clears throat> the stars came from Lookout Mountain, Tennessee. And my dad was part Cherokee. On his dad's side, the line was there. Mm. Let me see now. Tom Starr's son, Sam. Is, was Belle's husband. So Belle wasn't actually a star, but she got the name from the time she was married to Sam. And there is a star cemetery where uh, Tom and Sam and the rest of the family is buried down near Briartown. It's very interesting. Where is Briartown uh, in Porham? You know where Eufaula is? Yes, ma'am. Okay, it's, it's near... It's generally in that area. Okay. Mm -hmm. My grandmother, my mom's mother, was a still uh, Cherokee family, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> her grandmother came on the trail. Um, I have a picture of her at home. You do? Um, they always called her Old Granny. And uh, Old Granny came on the trail itself. And when my grandmother was just a child, uh, she said, you know, that some of them would stay with Old Granny. And uh, uh, you probably know the Cherokee belief that, you know, about owls uh, mean death. And uh, she said, old granny said that the owls followed them all the way along the trail as they came. And uh, <clears throat> I think I believe she said that uh, old granny carried a baby on her back. Now, I'm not sure if it was hers or her grandchild or who, but she carried a baby on the trail. And then my grandmother's dad... Uh, his, let me see, I'm trying to think, his his dad, let's see, okay, his name was Tom Still, 
and her mother's name was, uh, okay, old granny was her mother's mother. I hope I'm not confusing you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but one, one of the uh, ancestral grandparents there died along the trail. They died on the trail itself. How long did it take to come from Georgia to Oklahoma? On the trail? Yeah. I think about uh, three or four months. Uh, and she did say that, uh, now these are just, you know, these are things that were just handed down. She said that, uh, they said when they left their home, that all they, all they had were just the clothes they had on their backs. And uh, it was in the fall of the year and early winter, <laughs> and that their their shoes, their moccasins, you know, had uh, wore off their feet so that they were like barefooted. Uh, if I if I say peons, you know what I mean. I mean, sure. many of them were educated, professional people that came on the trail. So the uh, the homes in Georgia, like we said, mm -hmm. beautiful homes. I know. What kind of home did your family have in Georgia? That I don't know. No, I I don't know about that. I, I can tell you about John, John Francis Marion Christie's family. Uh, now, he was white, but I can tell you about them. <clears throat> when they came from Alabama to Texas, uh, they had several slaves, and they had, they had racehorses. They uh, grew horses. They uh, landed in East Texas. And uh, there's lots of Christies right now down in Texas uh, that are relatives of ours, and they all have big areas of land. And as a matter of fact, the airport in Dallas right now, you know that big airport at Dallas-Fort Worth? Yes. It's on land that belonged to some of the Christies. Mm -hmm. And in about 1936, when was the Texas World's Fair? 36. 36. It was centennial. Okay, that's right. We went down to Texas. And I, I said, we slept, <laughs> I guess, in the middle of the airport now. Because we, <laughs> we went to visit with these relatives, and their house was, you know, where their house was located. At that time, it was, uh, you know, more in the country. And uh, so they sold that property for, for that airport and got a pretty penny out of it, I might say. Yes. <laughs> Have you been there? I haven't seen the new one. Gigantic airport. Mm -hmm. But I... You know, I've heard, I've heard these marvelous descriptions and stories of the place, but I haven't seen it yet. My grandmother, let's see, you might be interested in this. Uh, my mom's mother, my grandmother Christie, was educated at Tahlequah, at what was the female seminary. The old or new seminary? The old. The old one. And uh, she was a school teacher before Oklahoma was a state. What was her name? Uh, Lula Caroline Steele Christie. And uh, she was a, she, I, as I said, she was a school teacher before Oklahoma was a state. And uh, one of the schools she taught at was located where the last going snake courthouse was located. There was a little town there called Going Snake, and uh, my grandfather worked in the store, and and they had a little post office, you know, in the store, 
So my grandfather was the storekeeper and the postmaster, and my grandmother taught school there. Hmm. And uh, this little community of Christie, Oklahoma, uh, my grandmother was responsible for establishing that school. Uh, they had property up near Westville, and of course Christie is 10 miles west. And uh, the Christies, my grandfather's folks lived at Christie, and my grandmother's folks lived near Westville. So uh, the grand, my grandfather's dad wanted them to move down in that area. And uh, they had some property there, and they built house, but my grandmother was hesitant to move because she wanted the children, you know, to go to school. Mm -hmm. And uh, didn't want them to have to stay in town to go to school. So what she did, she had box suppers in her home, and then she solicited some funds from the merchants in Westville and got enough money to build the school, to get the supplies, and then the men in the community built the first school there at Christie. And then my grandmother was the first teacher, and my aunt, my mom's sister, who's 83, let's see, this is 80, it should be 83 this year, uh, she said she can remember when they went to Tahlequah to get the books. Because it was, see, it was a Cherokee Nation school. Yeah. And uh, they went in a wagon. My grandmother and grandfather went in a wagon to get the books. And my aunt said she could remember that when they came home, you know, with those books. Uh -huh. Because uh, she loved books, you know. She said, oh, and she could remember they smelled new and everything. And they were sorting them out there at the house. And she could remember the books. What's your aunt's name? Ella May Christie Prophet, P-R-O-P-H-E-T. Where does she live? She lives right by my mom. They live on the old home place there at Christie. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom has a new Indian house that's in the same location where my grandmother and grandfather's uh, house was. And then there's a little house right down from it. They live up on a hill, and my aunt lives in a little white house there. So my mom is 80 and my aunt's 82, she'll be 83 this year. But my aunt always said you could remember how old she was by what year it is. She was born in 1900. So see, this year she'll be 83. Yeah. That's why it's easy to remember her age. Over here, I'm getting tired of leaning forward. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom and uh, all of her sisters have been teachers. School teachers. Um, did you know your grandmother? Yeah. Did she have any stories about the uh, seminary? Let me see if I can remember. I can remember one about my grandfather when he started the school. He said that his dad took him, and I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, <clears throat> his dad took him over in the wagon to go to school, to the boy, the, the male seminary. Male seminary. And he didn't want to go. He was the youngest one in the family and very spoiled, I'm sure. And he said that uh, he saw his daddy. He said, I saw him the whole night outside in that wagon. You know, it took all day to get 20 miles, you know, because there's two big hills in between. And he said, that sun was just going down, he said. And I got to thinking about my dogs. <laughs> and I thought, my dogs are going to be lonesome for me. And he said, boy, I just lit out for home. He went through the hills and almost beat his dad home. Walked home, went through the hills. You know, his daddy had to go around the road. And he said, they, he got home, he said, just, you know, about the sun up, walked that 20 miles, and they never did make him go back anymore. <laughs> oh. oh, I thought it was kind of funny. It is. Know? It is. <laughs> But I can't remember anything that my grandmother said about, uh, now my mom and my aunt would probably remember more, more of that. My grandfather was the one mostly that, you know, that told me all the, all the little stories like this about, uh, oh, about things like that that happened. You remember some more things he told you? He, he, he told me, he was the one that, you know, used to tell me all the stories. What, what was your grandfather's name? Uh, James L. Christie. Hmm. 
and he's the one that walked home from the seminary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He had a stomach cancer. Because you know, my grandmother was more of a serious type person, you know. You said your mother taught school too. Mm-hmm. Where did she teach? She taught uh, <clears throat> at. Uh, these are communities now, yes. and it was mostly all Indians at that time. Uh, Sanders and Whitmire, and she taught down at uh, Chile. Let's see, they didn't call it Chile; they had another name for it. Um, it was down by Chile, though, on the Illinois River. Holland, yeah, mm-hmm. that was what they called it, Holland School. Um. In up by Baltusville, called the Old School School District. Mm-hmm. What is that name? School School. You know. I think it was named after a man. Is that named after a man? I think so. Now were these different districts in the Cherokee Nation. Yes, there were seven. There were seven. You know, seven is a sacred number to the Cherokees. I guess did you know that? The seven, Probably. Mm-hmm. Seven clans of seven brotherhood. There's, se- there's seven, it was a very sacred number. There were seven clans, and there were seven mother towns to house the clans. There were uh, seven counselors to the chief. Uh, the council house was seven-sided. Everything was seven, which is important. Hmm. What's the origin of the Cherokee flag? I know it's, it's the seven clans. You mean where did they come from? Or, uh, uh, when did the seven clans get together? When did they get together? Yeah. Okay, what did the seven clans mean? Mm-hmm. All right, it was a form of government. And uh, each one of the clans had their own town. They called them mother towns that they lived in. And uh, a child in that particular clan was only permitted to marry in certain clans, and this was to ensure that nobody married their relatives. And all the little rules and regulations that they had, uh, if anyone violated any of these, it was a, they were put to death. That, that was the punishment. And uh, the form of government they had was very similar to what the United States government is today. And uh, I think in origin, we, they say that we're very much like the Iroquois because the Iroquois form of government is the same thing. What time period is this? I would say probably in the 1600s. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first recorded history, I think, that we have of the Cherokee country was 1540 when De Soto took his expedition through that area. and. Uh, that's the first, I believe, you know, that was reported about the Cherokee. And uh, when I was in the army at Savannah, Georgia, they had an Oglethorpe Park, mm-hmm. and it was James Oglethorpe. And in the park is the grave of a Cherokee chief that met Oglethorpe when he founded Savannah. Okay, this Cherokee lady that we read about in history, Nancy Ward, now she was my ancestral grandmother. We called her the beloved woman of the Cherokee. Uh, And David Hampton, I think you probably know David, uh, put out, he's a descendant of of her, also Nancy Ward, and he put out this book with all of her descendants' names in it. Well, up to a certain point, I mean, not current, but, you know, up to a certain point. So that's my ancestral grandmother also. James Starr uh, was, his mother was her granddaughter. I believe is the way it was. Now, when did she live, your ancestral grandmother? Nancy Ward? Yeah. I don't even remember. I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm going to have to now, I'm going to have to get, you know, program my brain into remember that. It's probably about that time because uh, they founded Savannah in 1722. Uh, trying to think the Cherokee chief's name. 
I think she was still living, but she would be an old woman when she yeah. got home. Uh, on my dad's side, <coughs> his, I would say my dad's family came from LJ, Georgia, and uh, his dad's grandmother was uh, Susan Doyle. She was a thousand old, at least one, you know, one of the two. Are there, is there a creation legend you feel you know? Just know that God already was talking to me on a Christian level when he spoke of me. He spoke to my mother because they had uh, stories uh, that were that we know of now in Christian religion about creation and Jesus and Abraham and you know all the biblical stories, Noah and the Ark, and Seth. All these people had chosen names. So that's always been real, real puzzling when uh, they were buried, but they had to wear, you know, the lost child to live there. And uh, because of all these stories, because they didn't really know how they had gotten all of these stories and about these things. And they believed that, uh, they believed that there's three worlds, uh, an upper world and this world and a lower world which, of course, is what Christian religion believes. And uh, uh, there is, okay, a legend. You want to know about the le Cherokee legend about how the world was created? Mm -hmm. Like I said, there were two groups there, so uh, two, two parts. Uh, the legend is that there was, they called it the Sky Rock. And on this, the Sky Rock became very crowded. Everybody lived on the Sky Rock. And it became very crowded. So uh, they were going to establish another uh, area to live, which would be like the Earth and the Sun. And uh, they sent, I believe it was, they sent some of the animals to make some vegetables to feed them as they were taking care of this. And uh, they explained how they got from the mountains and they stopped at the mountain and they were feeding the animals and they were doing all of this. But the truth was that Skywalk. How did they get down to the earth? And then there was us. <coughs> How did they get down? Well, now they didn't say that in the legend. I guess they climbed down. Probably, you know, in legends, this is about what it would say. They would climb down or maybe rode down on the back of a bird or something. 
You said that the buzzard, you said a buzzard. Was there a particular reason why it was a buzzard and not some other bird or an eagle or? I. Mountain sheep, uh, whiting, uh, Jacob's ladder. Um, those are some of the older flowers. And I do those when I have some contemporary designs too that I've created over the years. 
How long have you been reading Dracula? Making that? 1973. 73. Do you make a bastard or read a bastard? Read. Read. I'm not sure of the nomenclature on that. The Cherokees have always been weavers. Uh, they wove not only baskets, but they also wove cloth. They've always been weavers. And uh, I don't know, they say that we had baskets, you know, before we had pottery. But baskets were very important in Cherokee life. So the Cherokees were baskets. Mm hmm. Yes, they did. And at one time, uh, back in the early history of the tribe that we know, uh, the women were, they were like topless, you know, just little skirts, you know. <laughs> I said, here, they said, we have something for you now, or you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we did wear buckskin. I'm, have the Cherokees adopted any Plains Indians traditions? I would say the real traditional Cherokees haven't, but yes, the new ones. I think all of the Indians are, it's sort of an amalgamated <laughs> Indians now. Uh, they're adopting each other's uh, manner of dress and all that sort of thing, styles. But you know one thing that really that I I don't know I'm very I, it makes me sad to see this to see a tribe lose its identity. But you know the Cherokees never wore feathered headdresses. The Eastern tribes those were plains tribes, and it really makes me very sad to see say like an Iroquois or a Cherokee or somebody like that have their picture made you know with a feathered headdress on, mm -hmm. because that wasn't traditional for us. We have a photograph of Clement Porter, who was chief of the Sioux, and his official photograph, he has a full feathered headdress on. Mm -mm. It's wrong. Mm -mm. The Cherokees wore turbans. Turbans, mm -hmm. or like at one time I think they wore one feather, you know, one feather mm -hmm. in their hair. I'm curious about that. Uh, because uh, the all of the old paintings that we've been able to see, when I was working with the Potawatomis, all of the early, early pictures, the paintings that George Winter did of the Potawatomis in the early part of the 19th century show the Potawatomis wearing turbans. And uh, I've just been very curious about the, if there was any sort of uh, trade relationship between the Indians and the South eastern portion of the United States and those people up around the Great Lakes. Um, I think not there probably was. It's it's really, it's always interesting.
I said yes. I didn't answer what she said, but yes, sir, I knew it. And then she said, uh, in the story that um, that that she never shared. Any of those times or um, bands or groups um, in the in the Mississippi area in the in in, in the lower South Alabama, they had more of the church. Yes, the church was more of the gospel tradition. They left it as a traditional area.
Jacob and all they knew for those two days was really hard. Just they uh, on you know, like three years old, oh we're gonna give you a new this place and that place and they would like do each other to the point. And his name brought men named Eager and Ahimelech, and his name is Eber Hebrew. But to begin with, his name really was Hebrew Bethel. <laughs> and the way the Indian people named their children, and just you know, maybe that's what their first thought or something like that. And his name was really Abel Hebrew Bethel, but the family said, Oh, we don't need that buffalo on there, we can just drop that. So now their boy is Abel Hebrew. <laughs> so then he feels bad. You know, the father does the groundwork, all the animals are coming. I know people may be here and I don't know. But his father's name was Samuel Sr. And his name was Joseph Only. And his daughter is a good friend of mine and her name was her this is her married name, but her name is Rosemary Sepulchra. But they all have different names and her sister's name is Grace Medicine Flower. But this is all one family, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. This is what Mrs. Blackwell says that each brother took their own Indian name mm-hmm. so they all have different names. True. There's five brothers, and each one has a different name. Yeah, it's difficult sometimes to know, you know, just who's related. And another thing, too, because Indians have always had extended families. Uh, when you hear an Indian person say, that's my son or my cousin or that's my sister, it doesn't necessarily mean by blood. Mm-hmm. It may be just that they've adopted them, you know, because they have such extended families. Um, Sylvester Tinker yeah. has I uh-huh. interviewed him uh-huh. and he was adopted by um, Fred McGrath oh no Fred McGrath okay because he, he was the last chief mm-hmm. of the uh, oh, sorry, the last hereditary chief yes. of the Big Nation yes. and he said but they didn't adopt me legally as a white man does right he True. says I was adopted to him or by him to be chief because he said he had three sons and he says his sons were not chief material yeah but he looked around and he said he liked me and so he adopted me to be chief and he groomed me and he said the indians would adopt people and that's what uh, they do even now harrison talks a lot harrison hunter talks yeah. a lot about that he's got family everywhere me too <laughs> <gasps> well, um, look out in the look out when he was chief. Um, you know, when I, I was born in Harmony, and my folks yes. were working for the Oak Agency until they had their money. And you know, the lookout daughter is still living. Uh, Mary, have you ever Mary heard Mary Sunnyvale? Yes, I have her phone number in Broken Arrow. Broken Arrow. It's unlisted, and Sylvester Tinker gave it to me, but he told me not to tell her where I got the number. Therefore, I've hesitated to call her. And She's so a good friend of my mother's Mary. And once in a while, I take her my favorite scissors. You want me to ask her? Yes, ma'am. I would love to. <laughs> I've been find, trying to figure out.
So that day on the way home, that was 1973, and I told my mom, I said, now listen, I said, that does it. I said, that was just real embarrassing. And I said, just don't even mention that to me anymore. You know, that's embarrassing. And she said, no, when we get home, I'll show you, you know, some little tips. I get home with material, and, and it'll be easier for you. So, I, and I don't know, I've never been a person that liked to give up on anything. Uh -huh. You know, I, I just don't like to say, oh, I can't do that. So I thought, well, all right, I'll give it another whirl. So, so she showed me. She said, now, see, you put your hand here and you hold this. And she showed me just how to do it. Well, it just went so well, and I love to do it. And, you know, before we went back for the next day that they went up to work there, mm -hmm. well, I made two baskets. And it was just something that I really liked to do. And that's how I learned to do it. Mm -hmm. I've been doing it ever since because once I learned the basics and and I learned how to do it. I got to thinking about uh, the different colors I could get and the designs and what shapes you could get out of the baskets. And, you know, I just really got interested in the whole thing. Are there particular colors, you know, that are more Cherokee than any other colors, but some that are particularly significant? Uh, the colors they used, of course they had to, you, the colors they used that were made from natural dyes were what they had in their area, and that's mostly bloodroot and black walnut. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. they're the two colors they use the most. Mm -hmm. What materials do you use mainly for your baskets? I use a variety of things, but I try not to use anything that my people did not use. And it's what I use. I use black brush, and I use honeysuckle. And I use white oak splints, and I use some cane. Uh, as I said, just a very little bit of cattail because I wanted to see what that was like. And I use reed. And some of these things we gather ourselves. My husband helps me, and I process them. And then some I buy if I can find somebody who has it. So I use a variety of things. Which is the easiest to use? Which do you, which do you prefer using? Out of all the materials, uh, I don't know that any of them are really easier. Uh, it takes a great deal of preparation. Of course, the ones that I buy are the easiest in answer to that. that, that those are the easiest to use. But I don't know. I can't say that uh, I like to use any one better than the other because each particular basket that I do is, is a different thing to me. You know, it's, it's an individual one. So I can't say that uh, it's not like an assembly line thing, you know, where you just sit there and you go, everything's different. Uh, do you have an outlet for your baskets? Yes. Um, my. <laughs> career. <laughs> it has become a career, really. And when I started this, uh, it, I, I just did it for fun when I first started, and I never dreamed it would grow to the proportions that it has. But uh, many things I did not realize. I did not realize that people really were so interested at that time in Indians and their traditional uh, crafts and arts, uh, their traditions, the ceremonies, uh, way of life. Uh, people, you know, this was during a time, say the late 70s, when people were really very interested in Indians. You know how it became a mm -hmm. fad. People were interested. So I just got in, I guess, at a good time. And, uh, uh, but I did just for fun to start with. And it was something that I really liked to do. I didn't know I'd ever sell one basket that wasn't in my mind at all. It was something I liked to do and it gave me an affiliation with my tribe because it was something my people had always done and it gave me a good feeling to do that. Uh, my grandfather used to put bottoms in chairs, you know, like cane bottom chairs, and, and my grandmother did weaving on the loom, but they didn't make baskets. But some of my relatives did make baskets from way back when. But it was it was just something that I felt good about doing. And uh, living here, nobody had ever seen 
they were not aware of that particular style of weaving. And as you know, each tribe had its own particular way of doing things. And uh, I have a friend that is uh, that works with the Indian education out in Edmond, Sharon Harjo, and maybe you all know her. She's an artist, a painter. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I've seen some of her work. Okay, Sharon. Excellent work. Good mm -hmm. friend of mine. And uh, she asked me if she arranged for the programs, you know, for the school in Edmond. And she wanted to know if I could do a class. I said, oh, I don't know, Sharon, if I could do that. You know, because, I mean, I made baskets, but I said, no, I've never taught this. And she said, well, I think you could. So I gave it a great deal of thought. And I said, well, I, if she had that much faith in me, I certainly wouldn't attempt it. <laughs> so I did a class out in Edmond. Um, and so it went, it went very well. And I was pleased with the results. So from there, I worked through Title IV, and I did a lot of classes in the Putnam City School District. And it, it, like I said, it just mushroomed. Um, I had, at that time, they were having a lot of trade fairs in this area because the BIA was paying uh, money for all these craftspeople and artists to come that they would give them money. So I, living here, I went to the trade fair. I didn't get any money, you know, per diem or anything like that to be there. I just went because I wanted to go, and I had a few baskets. And I can remember I sold this first basket. I sold, and I thought, how wonderful somebody would want, <laughs> want this basket that I made, you know. And uh, then I started going to the trade fairs. I joined this Oklahoma Indian Artists and Craftsmen Guild and went to trade fairs that they sponsored. And then I, I worked in various school districts. Uh, and I taught a class for the Upward Bound students over at OBU. Mm -hmm. See, and I just met people through these different shows that I went to. And then there is a man here in town named Cliff Reader, and you may know him. I don't know if you know Cliff Reader. And at that time, he was working over at Anderson's at the antique store. And I saw him at Tahlequah. My mom and I set up a little booth at the National Holiday with our baskets. And uh, so Cliff came up, and he said, you live in Oklahoma City, don't you? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I'm helping get together a show for Anderson's Art Gallery. And uh, he said, I would like for you to be in the show if you would. And I thought, oh, that's terrific. And, I, and he said, would you do it? And I said, sure. All right, so I went over, and the first show I had in the gallery was at Anderson's. And uh, I don't know if it was through that show, and then they had a show a few months later, before Christmas, at Anderson's. And at one of those two, I met Mr. Walter Gray and Dan Blanchard from Channel 4 that, uh, that uh, do the Creative Crafts mm -hmm. shows. And uh, so... They collect baskets, among other things. And so Walter Gray asked me, he said, we would like to do a show with you. Would you be willing to go out and get natural materials? And because at that time, we was just buying, you know, everything. And I bought it through telephone. He said, would you be willing to go out and gather the natural materials and process them and the dyes, the, the stuff for the dyes, and make the dyes uh, for this show because we would like to put this on a program. And I said, yes, I could do that. Now I went home and I said to my husband, why in the world did I say that? I said, I've never done that. You know, going out, I, said, I know that is a mammoth job. So why in the world did I say that? I told him. <laughs> but they gave me several months to work on it. So I, what I did, uh, I went to the libraries. I went to Tahlequah to the library at the college. And I read all I could on Cherokee baskets and the materials. And, and I talked to a few people about how it was processed and stuff. So that summer, my husband and I went. That's the first time that we ever gathered any of the materials. And um, it was so much fun. I really got into it, you know. I, once, you, once you start doing this, you really get to it. And uh, then I went to feed all the other dyes that I could do. So now I do 13 natural dyes. Now, I just, you know, progress. But that's how I got into that. And uh, then from there, I've done three programs for them now, three creative crafts programs. 
And then Kelly Haney, was, I was in a show with him. You know who Kelly is? He's a uh, Seminole He's in artist. artist. Yes, okay. He's okay. also the representative for the Seminole area. The one your general has his paintings all over the office. That's Kelly. Mm hmm. Enoch. I think yes, his name okay. is Enoch Haney. Okay, at that time, Kelly had that uh, uh, Voices from the Land television program. He was the host that Sammy White now has. But Kelly uh, asked me if I would do a program with him. So I did the program for him. And uh, I don't know, like I said, one thing, just one door opened after another. And then uh, it just people I got to play with at the very show. And so now there are other people doing baskets in this area, but it's all a result. When I first started, nobody was doing them. Now, uh, do you have one main outlet now for your baskets? No, I work with uh, uh, the Oklahoma Art Center, and I work with the Galleria in Norman. And also there's another gallery in Norman called uh, Crosswinds. And now I'm going to be working with the Oklahoma Indian Art Gallery here in town. And let's see, there's a gallery in Tulsa called the Art Market. And then I'm a member of an organization that's called the Indian Arts and Crafts Association that has its headquarters in Albuquerque. And the people that belong to that, uh, all of the Indians that belong are the artists. And the other people that belong are museum people, gallery people, and collectors. And these people come from all the United States and even uh, European countries, and they come to, we have two markets a year. So I have other galleries and museums also that I deal with that are outlets, and uh, I'm on the board of the Wheel Rock Museum in Santa Fe, and uh, so that's an outlet for my baskets. And uh, I have some things in the Denver Museum. So and these people, you know, that come to the markets, uh, that's who I work with. And I didn't realize that was a unique Too style. Well. Yeah, it's a unique style, I guess, that is uh, uh, just native to our tribe, to the Cherokees. What do you mean by two walls? Uh, well, I start weaving the bottom of the basket, and I weave up. Weave the sides of the basket, and then I turn all these little spokes down, and then weave the outside, so that the outside is right next you know, to the inside, it feels like one thick wall. Okay. And um, nobody has ever seen that style of weave. And for a long time, I didn't know that it was unique. So people would say, well, why is this so thick? And I'd deal with it. Mm -hmm. They'd say, why is this so thick? And then I realized that uh, they didn't know it was two walls. And last summer, uh, I got to go up to the Smithsonian. And uh, people up in that area had never seen it. And they really were fascinated because I can weave a small basket. You know, I do demonstrations for mm -hmm. social groups, you know. Well, I, mean, you know no, I did. I did. Yeah. She's a very good friend of mine. She's a nice lady. Real nice. Those ladies were all just wonderful over there. And then, see, I went to the Cowboy Hall. I did a program for the Dosons and up to Oklahoma Museum of Art. And, uh, oh, business women. Club and the Folklore Society and the Anthropology Society, you know. So <laughs> it's a little program I do. Yeah. And I do a little demonstration. I weave a little basket that has, you know, a little two wall basket. Just a little one about that big. So I can show them all the steps, you know, how this is created. And uh, they always like to see that. Uh, the Smithsonian Festival last summer, uh, there was some uh, people from the Department of Agriculture came. And they were real interested. And so we did. We did an interview for television because I had some of the materials there that had gathered, like butt brush and honeysuckle. And so uh, he, did, he did an interview and he asked me how this process and I told him. And we talked a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. So he was interested with us. Well, the Department of Agriculture, of course, they're interested in plants and shrubs and all sorts of things like that. More questions. Yeah, I have two questions. Um, the, first of all, it, your mother or your aunt or anybody else that you know, do they have knowledge of or know anyone who would have knowledge of uh, the Sequoia Convention of the participation 
of Cherokees in the Sequoia Kingpin. I don't think, I've never heard of an incident. But they might know somebody that would. I've just been very curious about that. I don't think that it is, has been touched enough. I do not think that it has been recorded. Mm -hmm. It's very, it was very important to those people. Mm -hmm. We need some more information on that. Sure. And that my second question is, what is the percentage of the Cherokee tribe today that speaks the language, that still speaks the language? Not very much. Uh, of course, they're having bilingual classes now. They're the percentage. Let me see. I would have to guess at it. I doubt if 20%, I don't even think 20% of the tribe speaks the language. What about your mother and your aunt? Do they speak any of the language? No, very few words. My, my grandmother was fluent. You know, she mm -hmm. could read, write, and speak. Uh, she was fluent, but uh, of course they grew up in a time, now you think about it, when it wasn't really popular. That's right. Because everybody was trying to be white people then. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They were trying mm -hmm. to make white people out of the Indians, and, and it wasn't really popular at that time. Created some problems with the tribal blood degrees, too. Sure it did. Mm -hmm. Well, my, uh, my grandfather, when when he was registered, my mom's dad and his sister and brother, they were all four brothers and sisters, and they're all on the rolls of something entirely different. You know, the mm -hmm. people, too, that enrolled them were mm -hmm. all that accurate. Mm -hmm. So many things were done in the name of record keeping. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we had one man who came in, and his grandfather would not allow himself to be registered because he did not want those to know he was Indian. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And mm -hmm. so therefore, he was never enrolled. I know. It. And so he's having trouble proving that he's Indian. I know. But you look at it and you can tell. Yeah. Um, well, you know Virginia Stroud. Mm -hmm. I think she's the same boat. Uh, <clears throat> I know she's had some problem, you know, establishing her identity. <laughs> and you can tell by looking at her, she's Indian, you know. Is there anybody, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that you can think of that, uh, right off the top of your head, that is fairly fluent in Cherokee that we might be able to talk to and possibly get some, you know, some speakers down on tape? You know, some of the older people are very reluctant to talk with anyone. My mom and my aunt would probably know. Um, offhand, right now, I can't think of, uh, of anyone you might get right now. If I think of somebody, I'll let you know. You know, what, what we're aiming at is, as far as I know, there is virtually nothing recorded mm -hmm. on the Cherokee language on tape. Yeah. Now, we just want to like, get like the Cherokee alphabet on tape. Yeah. Um, That'd be somebody around Tahlequah. Yeah. And there are people down there that, let me just think about it. Let me get some thought to it, and I'll probably have to call you. Offhand, I can't just say. I've got one more question. I'm curious. I, you're such a busy lady. Do you weave, do you work every day, or do you have certain days during the week that you work on your baskets, or how do you handle your, you know, how much time do you spend? I work every day, so. How long does it take you from beginning to end? It depends on the size of the basket. Uh, it, it just depends, and the materials I use. I dye everything before I start, mm -hmm. so I don't have to stop and do that. Uh -huh. And um, I work usually at night. Uh, I do my best work at night because during the day I take care of business. And and really, it, it has gone from being just basket weaving to a lot of other things because I've worked like as a consultant, say art consultant, or a cultural consultant with schools, uh, and then I'm on the board of the wheel, right? Like I said, and I'm on the board of directors for um, this Indian Arts and Crafts Association, and I have to go for meetings there. Uh, I I promote some of my fellow artists. Mm -hmm. uh, I do a lot of work, just I mean, free, gratis, just because I want to help people. Um, trying to help get shows together, art shows together. Uh, I have done a certain amount of work with, uh, like this uh, Unity, which is the Indian Tribal Youth Organization. Uh, Willie Nelson did a concert, you know, for them, a benefit concert. 
and I've done some work with uh, with the uh, young Indian people at OU, the uh, organization here on campus, sort of benefit programs. But it's gone into so many things. See, my basket weaving, usually I do at night because I take care of all this other stuff during the day. I was just curious because mm -hmm. you were listing all these things, and I thought, my word, when she could, when could she possibly have time to weave a basket? I, I, I really, I don't really sleep, you know, like. I was wondering about that, too. <laughs> uh, sometimes, if I'm working on a special show, I'll work from maybe 6 o'clock in the morning, and maybe, I can remember that maybe just one more, and then I lay down for about three hours. Oh. You know, but oh, I work till almost every night till maybe 2 o'clock. Sometimes later, it depends. Oh, my. I'm doing special things. And it really, I mean, just thinking about, like, when I learned to do baskets in 73, now it's 10 years ago, right? And I've met so many people. You know, it really, like I said, it's opened so many doors for me because, like, my baskets are in the collection. You want to know who they're in the collection of? Some yes. of them? Mm -hmm. uh, well, okay, Willie Nelson, because I met Willie. And uh, Dr. Daniel Borston, the present librarian of Congress. Uh, John Denver, uh, Ted Kennedy. I've got to meet all these people, you know. It's just really interesting. That's exciting. Yeah, and and a lot of museums. Mm -hmm. But and I guess you know what's really been so much fun for me is because I like people, all kinds of people. It's just interesting to me to meet people and see what they do and talk with them. And I just have a question. Sure. You say you went to California in 30... 42. Uh, 42. Did uh, your father go out there to work in a plant, defense plant? Or? Okay, my, my father, remember as I told you, was injured in the oil fields right. and was not able to work. But his family had all gone out there to work. And it, this was in northern California, in Westwood, which was about 100 miles approximately from Reno or in the California side. And uh, my dad went out to visit with his brothers and sisters on a visit. And of course when the war came along, you know, about that time, and uh, the plants were hard put for workers, and they paid real good. And like I said, we had lived very, <laughs> I said poorly, all the time. And the plants were paying real good money, and the lumber industry had many jobs that were easy to do. And so when he went out to visit with them, they said, well, you could, you could do this work because it's easy. You don't have to lift anything heavy. And, uh, of course, he had a problem with his back. And they said, uh, you don't have to lift anything heavy, and I just think you could get a job. Well, he went down to see about it, and they said, if you pass the physical, you know that you can. So he did, and he got a job in this lumber. It was in the plywood mill, and of course that's very light uh, stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And he didn't really have to handle anything. I mean, some they had machines. All he had to do was push a button to run the machines, or something like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he got a job, and then that's when my mother and I went out to California, and that's how come we went. And then when we were there, my mom. Uh, got a job. She was the manager of a grocery store. It was a chain uh, grocery store business in California called Kilpatrick's. And uh, they had stores in different towns. And as a matter of fact, uh, we always called Westwood the port of entry because when the war came around, there were so many people that came there from other states, a lot of people from Oklahoma and Minnesota, and just, we call it the port of entry. You know? <laughs> they came there and it, it paid real real good money. Did you meet any of the old people in California that went? Oh, I, yes, my gosh. Uh, especially the area around Westville. Everybody, I can't tell you how many people would stay with us when they first came before, they'd come to get a job, and they'd stay with us until they got a job and a place to live. Then after I finished high school, I finished high school there, and uh, I went to work in the office. Uh, this was a company town, and it was run uh, to begin with by the Red River Lumber Company, and then they sold out to what was called the Fruit Grower Supply Company. It was an affiliate of Sunkiss Growers. 
and I went to work in the office, and uh, uh, I was in employment, and I was the head of employment. I became the head of employment. And I know it sounds, in this day and age we're living in, I know this sounds very funny, but I took care of the records for about 1,500 people. And I also did all the hiring, and I processed, uh, uh, like, leaves of absence, medical leaves or personal leaves of absence, and all of the uh, terminations. Uh, and I did all the hiring, and I had to go. It was a real interesting job, you know. And I had to go uh, out to, like, the woods. They had, they had all phases of, uh, of this town of uh, a logging operation. Okay, they had logging out in the woods, they had logging camps. And they had logging department. Um, and then in town they had a plywood department, a sawmill, and a green lumber, and they made Venetian blinds. And so all these departments. So uh, after I had gotten this job as head of employment, I had to go to different departments. And it was just fun, though, because I got to go out in the woods, I had to wear a hard hat, you know, and wrote on a, you know, like a caterpillar, mm -hmm. and I got to see, you know, how they, well, it was my job to know what these jobs consisted of, so I, when I hired somebody, I would know whether they could do it or not, talking with them and all that, so that was just real fun, so I did that, and uh, consequently, I did hire a lot of people from Oklahoma. They came out looking for jobs, and sometimes I would go home at night, maybe they'd be waiting for them. <laughs> They got the word, you know. <laughs> and they'd be at my house waiting for me. <laughs> when I got, got it was, you know, say people that knew my folks, or knew some of my folks, mm -hmm. or knew somebody that my folks knew. Mm -hmm. See, they'd say, oh, well, she's, you know, in it Now you go and see. So I'd go home and there. They'd be here, so and so. They're looking for a job, you know. <laughs> How long did you work there? At Fruit Growers? Yeah. Until I got married and left, let me see. I worked, uh, Oh, a little over two years in that position. What years did you work there? Uh, 52 to 54. Mm -hmm. And uh, before that, I worked uh, in an insurance office. I had to think about this. This is a long time. Gee, probably before you were born, let's see. In an insurance office. And uh, then I did bookkeeping for a minute. had a service station in a garage. I had two jobs at once. But I don't ever want to do that again. Mm -hmm. Two jobs at once, it's too hard. And uh, then I got married in 1954, and my husband and I moved to the Los Angeles area, and uh, he was going to school at uh, Northrop Aeronautical Institute. I had to think of it. Now they change it to call it a university, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I worked for North American Aviation. And I did basically the same thing I did in Westwood. I worked in employment. And then um, we lived there a little over a year. And after he completed school, we went, we moved to Sacramento. And I worked for the state of California for California Highway Patrol headquarters. And I was in personnel. And so I did basically the same thing. I was in charge of the recruitment program. And I took care of the uh, investigations for people who had applied for a position with the Highway Patrol. And now this was civil service, so you know you, there's a lot of red tape involved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I, I took care of all that. But it was important. What's your husband's name? Victor James Doring. <laughs> he was born in Montana My and raised goodness. in California. I have one son. I have to tell you about my son. Hey, I'm like that guy on TV, you know, who says, have I told you about my son? No, I have to tell you, I have one son. His name is Scott Francis Doring, and he's at Harvard, and that's why I have to tell you that. He's going to graduate uh, in June. Harvard. Graduate school. What in? School of Government, uh, Public Policy. He had uh, his undergraduate work he did at OU, and he got two degrees at OU, and then he also attended a summer program at the University of Texas at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs. That's a long name, huh? Mm. I've been there. Well, I lived there in Austin for a while. Did you like Austin? I loved Austin. He did, too. He really liked Austin.